But right now, I'd like to uh, kick everything off by, first of all, thanking one of our panelists, Sammy Slovey, for instigating this particular panel today, and even for recruiting our fabulous moderator, Allison Fensterstock, who is going to take it from here. Thank you all so much for being here. All right, thanks, Scott. Um, so I'm assuming if you're here at Sync Up, you like live music in New Orleans. Um, and if you do, then you should thank all of these people for what they do all year round. Uh, we have people who do front of house sound, uh, tour management, stage management, uh, talent hospitality, and all kinds of behind the scenes work in the live music business. Um, I was hoping maybe we could go down the line and you guys can each let us know what your specialty is in the field and maybe how you got interested in it in the first place. My name is Addie Olson. Um, I currently work with Winter Circle Productions. We're a local promoter in New Orleans and we're actually the AEG Live or AEG Presents Gulf Coast office. Um, I actually started w working with Winter Circle right when I graduated from Tulane. Couldn't leave New Orleans, love the city. And um, I had a very early interest in working in the music industry. I reached out to them, one of the first shows they ever produced over Jazz Fest back in 2009, and started as one of their first street teamers, ended up being one of their first full-time employees, and have really seen the company grow to where it is now. Um, producing Buku, which is our annual festival, which takes place at Mardi Gras World in March. Um, so I act as the festival director for Buku, and then I oversee all of the marketing and administrative for our office. All right. <laughs> uh, my name is Sammy Slovey. I'm an independent contractor based in New Orleans. I am a tour manager, a production manager. I mostly work with artists who are not based in New Orleans. Uh, however, I am involved in a lot of projects locally, uh, production coordinator on Buku Festival, um, freelance stage management and um, promoter repping, amongst probably a million other things that I won't bore you with. Um, I got into the industry because when I was a senior at Tulane, my friend was working as an accountant at French Quarter Fest, and she said, hey, they're hiring paid interns, you'd be an idiot not to apply. And I was like, cool, I like festivals, I wanna work with my friend and get paid. <laughs> Sure enough, um, I got hired to intern at French Quarter Festival, which led to a full-time job with a local production company. Um, after about three years with that production company, I knew I wanted to tour and travel, um, so we parted ways, and um, I started freelancing slash bartending, <laughs> which was definitely a tough process, but it definitely um, led me to where I'm at today, which is incredible and uh, managing my calendar alone is kind of a full-time job, but I love what I do, and I get to work with some really incredible people, which I'm very grateful for. My name is Christine McBride. I'm currently a project manager with Solomon Group. Uh, my specialty, I think, is logistics and operations. So before I hand it off to talent department or the um, production managers uh, to do all the technical for a stage, I'm talking to everybody to make sure I have all their needs in place before I hand it off uh, for different size events from small to large festivals. Um, I got my start. It's kind of a convoluted, long, very long story, but I'll I'll shorten it a little bit that I was on a completely different track in life um, doing international public health. I had just finished a graduate degree in diplomacy and 9-11 um, happened a week after I got back from South Africa. And uh, they put a hiring freeze on all international organizations including the United Nations and I thought, okay, I have a lot of student loans. What am I gonna do with my life? And I had the opportunity to jump into the Revlon Run Walk for Women, which was produced by Rehaj Entertainment based out of New Orleans, um, and jumped on their team for the next five years. And the rest is history, and I never looked back. It was exactly what I was supposed to do with my life. If it's me, so my name is Sharita. Um, I currently work for Jazz Fest. I'm an administrator over there, so I work throughout the year um, to kind of make everything happen, specifically in Congo Square. I also work on just a bunch of different festivals and events around the country. So kind of like uh, Sammy, I, I do a lot um, throughout the year. And I actually got my start um, on Twitter. I was also a senior at Tulane. And <laughs> I was a senior at Tulane. And um, 
at, at the time, 106 in Park, it was a popular show on, on BET. Roxy, the host there, she was having an event in New Orleans during Essence Festival, and I was so excited, and I tweeted, and I was like, I'm a student at Tulane, I would love to help, and she DM'd me and was like, contact my manager, and I reached out to a manager, and that was pretty much my start. I loved it, um, and I never really looked back, and it just kind of took me forth from there. <laughs> that, that is a really awesome story. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Alex Diaz. I'm a Furner House audio engineer, and I'm also a tour manager, production manager. I'm like Sammy, I do everything, but what I really love to do is mix. Um, I went to Savannah College of Art and Design for sound for film, and actually moved to New Orleans hoping that I would get in, and when the film industry was booming, hoping that I would get into that, and um, I needed work, and somebody suggested that I go over to House of Blues and interview and started live mixing and pretty much never looked back. And now I tour with Dirty Dozen and some other bands and uh, get to travel the world and I love it. And um, actually, kind of like you, I, I got into it because I was going to school for acting and set design and Katrina happened and I just needed a change. After that, really, it was uh, kind of traumatic and trying to build eighth inch models after, like, you know, the entire region had been destroyed. I just kind of just wanted to do something different. And um, I don't know, music really filled up a place in my heart that I think was missing. So, um, well, I guess you guys will notice if you're observant that we all have something in common. We are all female. Um, and, and part of what this panel is about, I think, is talking about you know diversity behind the scenes and what you guys have, what you guys deal with, you know, uh, working in a field that where, where we might not be as well represented as men. Um, so I guess if anyone wants to talk about maybe like Alex, how do you feel about working in live sound as a woman? <laughs> I feel like uh, oh now yeah. okay. Um, <laughs> It's been a very long jazz fest. I was very <laughs> concerned about what might come out of my mouth this early in the morning. Um, <laughs> but I find it, uh, it, obviously, I think in New Orleans, I only know one or two other female audio engineers. So, and it is definitely different, uh, you know, as far as like uh, not getting to work with colleagues that, that are female a lot of times. Um, how you behave, I think, does change. And I think as I've gotten older, um, I've had more control over that mm -hmm. myself. You know, I think at first, um, you want to kind of join the boys club. And I right. think that it's problematic, you know? Um, it creates, it blurs lines, I think, a lot. And, uh, and I think I've gotten much stronger at being able to continue to be feminine and be my feminine self um, without having to um, adjust to be accepted. But that, you know, <coughs> it takes a while. But I do find that, you know, because when I show up to work, and <laughs> actually, Sammy and I have been <laughs> having a funny conversation <laughs> about <laughs> pants. <Yeah>. But, <laughs> but it is, uh, it's true. It, and, and it kind of came up with, like, we're, where we were talking, like, you don't want to wear certain things because you don't want to be over-sexualized. Mm -hmm. And you don't want the guys to, like, I have to worry about whether or not they're going to respect me, um, depending on what I wear. And I kind of, I decided to stop caring. But, <laughs> you know, like, and, and if I want to show up, and I notice that the difference is, like, uh, if I don't show up kind of dressed like a guy and look like a roadie, then they assume I'm somebody's wife or girlfriend, even if I walk in and to introduce myself as a front house engineer. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Well, and I think your field is especially like associated with dudes, mm -hmm. you know, the live sound stuff. Some of the rest of you are maybe in parts of production that are actually more associated with women, especially like caretaking -y jobs, like, like artist management and hospitality and stuff. Do, do you feel like the field kind of genders different roles? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> Sammy, you sound enthusiastic. <laughs> um, one of the biggest questions that I always have to 
handle with um, the most thought out answer is, oh, you're a female who works in production. I need a hospitality coordinator. I need somebody to run artist relations. I really need somebody to set up dressing rooms. And I, I don't do dressing rooms. I, I stage manage, I work production. I interface with audio companies and lighting companies and video companies and audio engineers and lighting guys or girls. And um, it's not what I do. And I constantly have to say, well, thank you so much for thinking of me. I, d I really appreciate it. However, my focus is in production. If you have any stage manager or production positions available, but it, back to your question, yes. Um, typically, hospitality positions or dressing room positions are filled by females. Typically, artist relations departments at festivals are filled by females. Um, a lot of like um, artist transportation roles are filled by females. Um, runners. runners filled by females often, uh, because I think that there's a uh, like a gender bias for sure. Um, that, oh, you're a female who works festivals, like I'm gonna put you in this position. Or, oh, you're a female who tours, like I'm gonna put you in this position. And similar to what Alex was saying, there's many times last year, um, I was a touring production manager for some fairly large touring acts, and I'd show up on stage, and depending on what I was wearing, which is really messed up, um, I would be treated differently. If I wasn't dressed like a roadie, um, so to speak, for lack of a better term, um, it'd be like, oh, are you the tour manager? Are you like, you know, so-and-so? And, -so? and um, you know, you have to be like, oh, no, I'm actually the production manager. You know, let's start talking about our show for the day. And um, once you start communicating your knowledge and your expertise to those people, they're quickly like, oh, whoa, okay, got it. <laughs> but there are definitely gender biases within the industry. Um, you know, booking agents, a lot of females, managers, some females, uh, but I definitely think that it's, uh, it's a thing, but you're looking at a group of women who are really working to break that mold, which is really empowering. Anytime you meet somebody that's a female in any of those positions that are typically filled by males. Well, I'll just say for me, I, I mean, I dress very feminine and um, I mean, obviously I get a lot, uh, you know, the guys, they'll try and um, come on to me or things like that. And I'm just, once I open up my mouth and I'm like, okay, we need to do this, 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 and that, then they're, they kind of back off because I'm kind of notorious. I like to wear skirts, so I wear skirts a lot in, you know, different production settings. And, but once you speak up and you let them know that you're here to get the work done and you don't entertain what they're talking about, they kind of get it and eventually everybody falls in line and, you know, they respect you. Oh yeah, no, that, that's kind of an, an interesting, like sticky topic to talk about. Cause like, it, this is like the music business. It's a party business. There's a very casual atmosphere that like, you know, it doesn't always, but can sometime like blur the lines for appropriate behavior mm -hmm. at work. And I think for, for women, especially for younger women in the field, that, that can be a little bit of a, a professional minefield. Um, we've certainly seen a lot of articles this year about some publicists and some people in the industry who, you know, were called out for inappropriate behavior and even assault. Um, and it was, uh, you know, the kind of thing where you're just always in bars or you're always, you know, out late at night. So I guess, have you guys dealt with that? And like, if you have, what? What have you done, or what would you advise people to do? I'll, I'll start. I'll start off with like a um, a lighter situation of that. Um, for example, I toured Thirty Dozen, and and I love these guys. I don't want to call them out, you know, mm -hmm. but they are older men, and they're from the south. And I think sometimes they don't even know when something is appropriate or not. Mm -hmm. For example, a lot of times when we get on the stage and they can tell that, because um, they do respect me, but they can tell that the house person isn't respecting me <laughs> um, or treating me differently or says something like, who's your husband? Um, they'll say something like, oh, this is Alex. She's the best sound engineer in the world. She's great. But you know, the real reason we keep her around is because look at her. Like, <laughs> um, and it's like, you did so well for a second. <laughs> yeah, just, and then it just went. You almost got it. 
<laughs> you know? And then now this person doesn't respect me anymore because you're basically saying you took me on the road because I'm pretty. Like, and, and I think that it's just like, I'm like, no, 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 oh, oh okay. <laughs> but I, I think that speaking of like the more casual vibe, that sort of beca- uh, started happening because we've become, I'm the only crew member on that tour. Mm-hmm. So we spend a lot of time together, you know, and we joke around a lot and there's definitely a casual atmosphere between us. And I think that while that is not necessarily inappropriate when we are alone in an environment where we are around other people and other professionals that are that I have to work with and, and manage that day, because mm. as a single crew member, that crew, the house crew, so the house audio engineers and house lighting people, um, those people become my crew for the day, and I'm, I'm managing them, and, and I need them to respect me in a certain way. Yeah. I definitely experienced a lot of things early in my career, um, but as soon as I set the tone that, look, I'm managing this process, I'm managing this event and this site, and um, set the tone to respect me early on. I think that, I don't know if word passed around or anything, but I feel like sometimes, especially in the last few years, people look at me like the mom on site or, you know, or grandma even, and they, <laughs> like they say, you know, they're, they're not quick to, to use those jokes around me or make those comments around me. Like, I'm not an uptight person. I'm, you know, free and loving. And, uh, but um, I do find that early in my career, um, definitely experienced that more, but as, as I matured, as mm-hmm. other people, I guess, matured in the business, I don't experience that as much anymore. Well, I'll say, I think I probably missed a lot of that because I am married with children and the word has spread. Everyone, <laughs> <laughs> everyone kind of knows that, so I don't get bothered as much. So I think, you know, I'm still pretty young, and so I think that I, I missed that boat, that uh, I didn't have to learn a lot of things early on because, because I'm married and I have children. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of get that mom thing, too, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I think same goes with me as earlier on in my career, that I definitely experienced it more often, especially when you're working environments with artists and artist crews that might not be as professional as the ones we all produce now. So you really have to know what your boundaries are and what you think is appropriate or inappropriate behavior and be confident in you know, your ability to speak up against that sort of situation. And also, I think you know, in some situations, unless it calls, you shouldn't feel the need to overassert yourself either because sometimes actions can speak louder than words and it might speak louder if, if you just turn yourself away from the situation and make it clear that you don't condone in it. I mean, I, I, as front of house, um, we're there, we're the first ones there and the last ones out, right? So a lot of times we are the last ones there and when the artists are still partying, you know, they come up and I mean, I guess, and this is, and I, and I hope I don't get judged for saying this, but I do think that a lot of times I create a more um, friendly environment for the artist, and then that is taken the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So I I do like to cater to my artist's needs, but I think that creating that friendlier environment, telling them all the time that, you know, um, I'm there for them for whatever they need, and joking with them and trying to, like, keep a nice atmosphere, because I don't know if everyone knows this, but sound guys are kind of notorious for being grumpy. (laughs) And, like, (laughs) and... (laughs) and <laughs> in a bad mood. And so I really like to try to break that mold, you know, gender aside. And I think that creates this, sometimes it gives them the wrong impression, as though I'm flirting, right. and right. that's not what I'm doing. And I think that's why a lot of women in the music industry kind of have to put up a barrier um, yeah. in, in some situations and almost come across as more hard than they may seem. Um, just because you're dealing with those sort of issues. I kind of agree with everybody and what they've all said, and similar to what Alex was saying, um, it does depend on the gig, but when you're on tour, you do have to kind of be a little bit more smiley and a little more relaxed and friendly, um, especially as a female in production, because we do have to put up that extra barrier. Um, And honestly, 
with your question, it's still something I struggle with on every gig. I mean, a lot of it has to do with what you're wearing. Some of it has to do with, you know, is your hair pulled back that day or are you wearing your hair down? Um, sometimes, you know, if you're in the South, it's a lot different than if you're in the Pacific Northwest. It, like, definitely. Um, there's a lot of women in production in the Pacific Northwest, so when you're up there, it's like no difference and it's totally cool. You walk into a venue in Birmingham, Alabama, it's gonna be a lot different than when you walk into a venue in Seattle um, and how, how you're gonna be treated as a female working production. Um, it's very, very, very challenging when male coworkers or male artists feel that it's okay to um, hit on you or or just like touch you, like something like this or like this. You know, the arm grab is one I get all the time if I'm like wearing a t-shirt and I'm just like, ugh, I like shudder in my skin. And I'm like, please stop touching me. So knowing your boundaries, like, like Addie said, and, and being able to really uh, communicate that and, and put your foot down, but it's definitely one of those constant struggles. Yeah. I, I, I just wanted to say something to what Addie said about having to put up a shield and a barrier. And that, that is something that I feel like I did more of when I was younger and I have been able to let it down now because I, I can keep my like kind of happy sensibility and the not flirty but like friendly environment and still have my guard up in, in a way because I, I had that happen the other night. Um, I had a great show, a great mix and when I get really excited and I'm mixing, I, I start to dance, you know. And one of the bands that had performed, um, one of the members came up and asked if he could come behind front of house to watch me mix. And I said, of course, you know, I always want, and a lot of people ask if they can come, um, you know, they, they have questions about what I've done. So, and they want me to teach them. And that was sort of the impression that he gave me as to why he wanted to come over there. And then he got closer and closer and then tried to put his arm around me and then tried to flirt with me and I was like, um, excuse me, <laughs> like, I just want to be clear that I'm not flirting with you. I was happy to work with you today and you, your band was very kind and professional. I would like for you to keep it that way, you know? Um, and kind of, he got the memo and he backed up, but uh, you know, I, it's something that happens every day. That I, and, it, and honestly, learning to deal with it is kind of different every day too. Yeah. Yeah, that also, that must be for you two who do tour management, that must be extra exhausting because you have to, well, you have to meet a whole house crew of new people every day and make friends with them. Yeah. And I would already be tired by having to be that nice. And then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say something to what you just said, which I, um, it's just a pet peeve. And I do do tour management and I often am a tour manager, but when I'm out just doing sound, mm -hmm. um, I find that that it ha happens to me a lot where people introduce me as a tour manager. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, I'm in the front of house, yeah. you know? Or they, they put sort of down, they downgrade my sound skills somehow. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not really what I do. And I'm, I find that interesting and odd. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And for you guys who do festivals, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like, especially you, Addie, because you've been at uh, Buku since the beginning and watched it grow from an indie, you know, to the association with AEG and it's kind of a, more of a powerhouse. Um, I guess how you feel like your role has maybe helped diversity at your festival or just how it's, how you've observed it, you know, changing yeah, for or not sure. changing? Um, you know, we have a lot of rock star females on our team, both with Winter Circle and Buku. Um, you know, four out of the seven people on our core staff at WCP are women. Um, Buku has many female-led departments, but that's definitely not to say it's perfect. I think we can always, you know, be striving for more gender balance across all of our departments, especially in production, side ops. Um, luckily, we have Sammy here in, in production and, and, and some uh, female stage managers, um, and as, as well as females in the side ops department. But then on the opposite side, like we were speaking about, there's also this, um, you know, gender imbalance within either the more female-oriented departments, like artist relations and hospitality. And I think those could kind of better from some gender balance as well. 
Um, so it's something that we're always thinking about, not only with our staffing, but also with artist bookings. Um, I think Pitchfork released something recently that only 14% of the artists on festival lineups are female. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really kind of scary stat to look at. I don't think it's just relative to festival bookings. It's the uh, talent as a whole, especially with EDM, which we do a lot of. You really don't find many female um, EDM acts. So it's something that we're very conscious of, and I'm not directly responsible for the booking with Buku, but I can say that Dante, our buyer, and everyone in the office, you know, we talk about this, uh, we acknowledge it, and we do try to um, book female acts. Sometimes it's harder to do so than others, um, but it's something we're all really conscious of, um, so it's important to us. Interestingly enough, my uh, first couple of festivals that I worked on were, was Voodoo, and thinking back, and I'm having flashbacks, that it was a female-driven team. Yeah. That Voodoo was run by a core group of women, Megan Grant, Alex Grant, Ashley, um, Tracy Kessler in the early years, myself, um, and then until we passed it off to the production managers who were traditionally male um, for each of the stages, but I'm thinking back as well, even the stage managers, Sammy um, what was one of them, um, Amy, uh, a few others were all women. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that my experience early on in my career was all surrounded by um, women, strong women, um, and uh, gifted women in this field. So I've been very lucky. Yeah, and for me at Jazz Fest, it's lots of women. Um, mm -hmm. A lot yeah. of the departments are headed by women. Um, yeah, now that I think about it, I can't even think of many of the guys. <laughs> 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 Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, but it's, it's lots of women, like she said, strong women. And more, most recently, I start like recruiting for some of the Essence Festival, um, the talent over there. And uh, for like the NBA, I had to recruit. And I specifically pick women, mm -hmm. and, and particularly um, African-American women, because they're not, they're not a lot at all in production and in the music industry, so. Also, I think that um, it's a good kind of consideration to think about our woman, someone said this to me recently, um, that she believed you know, many women were the contributing factors to the success, or they were seen as mm -hmm. the contributing factors to success of events in the industry. Most of the festivals that we work, and most of the festivals in New Orleans, were founded by men, and men are you know, the main producers on the event. But the women, uh, in many cases, really lead the events and are, hold you know, great leadership roles in the events. But are they seen as contributing factors to the success of those events? Are they given um, the same sort of um, reverence as the men who founded the shows? Right. Is there, is there like a female Quint Davis out there somewhere? Is there someone with that kind of profile? When I think and about that, that in the festival industry, there's not someone that comes to mind. I think the closest thing is um, there's a female engineer that works with Pearl Jam that started a company called Sound Girls, which is not a festival, but she does a lot of really awesome programming for young women who are interested in learning audio. Uh, but I, I mean, I probably work a dozen festivals a year, and no, I've never experienced a female Quint Davis. Mm -hmm. However, I've experienced a ton of incredible women that are really the driving forces in making those festivals happen, whether it be female festival directors um, and other females in roles involving artist relations or other departments throughout the festival. Um, you know, without stereotyping, women tend to be more organized and can usually handle a situation a little bit better, um, where guys will kind of usually just like take a step back and not really deal with the issue. Um, yeah, I was, I was gonna say, yeah. I think that um, a lot of the reasoning, and, and lately this has been happening to me um, more than before, um, I think where earlier in my career being female was limiting me, and it was, like I could change it, <laughs> but, uh, it was more difficult for me to get work because people thought, oh well, you know, will you be able to lift that, you know, will you be able to do this, And but now I'm finding more and more um, 
projects and events that are wanting to work with female engineers. And they really enjoy it because of, one, they, they can be a little bit more delicate in situations that, especially with high profile artists or, or sensitive artists, um, or, or like for example, the music box, um, I'm just starting to work over there. And it's oh, cool. this idea of like a, um, creating a show and I think wanting to be sensitive to the artist's sensibilities and, and, and things like that. Um, and also, I, I think women can tend to be, a, keep, keep things a little bit more serious and more in line. And I think that the guys start joking around and it gets a little bit out of hand sometimes. Or like you mentioned earlier, male sound engineers tend to be very grumpy. They are grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it sounds like, like things are getting better in terms of representation um, what are some of the other issues you feel like you're facing? Is there like, a, I don't know, titles or, you know, job yeah. titles or pay? Yeah. Pay. Yeah. Yeah. pay, I for mean, sure. I, I yeah. do want to say, say one thing as far as representation because I, um, I am actually I'm the only sound engineer on this panel and I have probably met 14 female engineers in my seven years touring the entire world. I have probably met about 2,500 male engineers. So as far as like representation, mm -hmm. it is getting better. And in certain areas, there are lots of women and I think it's being encouraged still. But out of maybe the 100 or 150 people that I asked just to kind of get an idea, mm -hmm. um, I say, well, ha do you know any female audio engineers? And Carrie Keys was literally said by Everyone. It's the only female audio engineer that they know. And most of them realize I am actually very often the first and only female engineer um, the, that they've ever worked with. And I feel like so the representation thing is it's still <laughs> tough. You know, there's still not a lot of them. But um, yeah, I think that's better. that's really important. Not only you know, across the industry, but also, you know, up and down too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we always hear, or we always talk about the term glass ceiling and the glass ceiling effect, um, which is a great metaphor, but I also think that it sort of um, implies that there's this one time in your career where you're gonna hit a barrier preventing you from reaching that top level, but I think I've more aptly heard it described as a labyrinth. Like, throughout your whole career, you're overcoming these obstacles and, you know, encountering these barriers that prevent you as a woman or, um, you know, as a minority through going into different positions. And I think it's important for us to realize that and then also um, you know, to recognize what that, what those imbalances are. Um, so I think, you know, in the UK, they do a much better job at really analyzing this in their music industry than we do. Um, I think they put out some research recently that showed that only, th women only held like 30% of positions at the top executive levels in the industry, but 59% of the lower level and entry level jobs. Um, so I think we can do a better job in the U.S. industry at seeing like what those numbers look like, how deep that divide is, and also um, understanding what contributes to it, not only with the gender imbalance, but also with uh, pay gap and wage gap. So um, that's, I think that's really important. I think wage disparity is a big one with non-professional organizations. Um, I think touring, not so much. Touring, usually, you know, you, there's a business manager looking at a budget and they're gonna fill the role based on qualifications, male or female. That's the amount they have budgeted. Um, I think when you work as a freelancer, it's something I struggle with all the time when people are like, well, what's your day rate? And, you know, day rate is such a variable term. You know, well, how many hours am I working? What are you expecting me to do? You know, am I gonna be there for 18 hours or am I gonna be there for eight? Am I physically gonna be changing over the stage? Are there stage hands? Um, there's a lot that goes into what's your day rate. Um, I find that certain organizations are really good about it. You know, touring, certain festivals, they're like, this is what we have budgeted. It doesn't matter who you are. This is what you're gonna get paid. 
But then on the other coin, you know, when you're just freelancing and people call you to work an event, they may offer you a much lower rate than a lot of your male colleagues. And people don't talk about pay in our industry. It's very taboo in this industry. Nobody really talks about it. Um, I can't comfortably call one of my male colleagues who has the same position as I do in another event and say, well, what did you get paid? Because it's considered very insulting, it's considered very taboo, very inappropriate to ask. Um, it's a conversation yeah. that we need to be having because, you know, especially as independent contractors, like, at what point can we say, well, like, this is what I want to get paid and this is what should, this is what this position pays a male who would be in this and role, and you don't I always find, know. I, I find it interesting because I, in the same way, I didn't feel comfortable asking someone who had, you know, um, there are several like repeat shows, right? That that happen, especially during Jazz Fest, and and not the festival itself, but the night shows. And someone might have been mixing that same show for the last five years, but now they're going to go do something else. And I've, I've been the one to take over on a lot of those, and didn't feel comfortable like asking the person who did it before what they made, but I was, I was lucky on a couple of those things, someone reached out to me and said, hey, what did they pay you for that? Because um, I wanna make sure, like, and then I told them, and it turns out there was a, a big difference, and it was a male, and they said, well, you need to go and tell them that I, you know, this is what you should be making for this. And I've had several male engineers um, have my back on those sorts of things, which is, I'm often on my events the one that is hiring the freelancers. Um, so I can't even tell you the countless conversations I've had with female friends of mine who have applied for a job or, or I've reached out to and say, hey, can you work this gig? And they say, oh, do you think this rate will work or if this, and we're so quick to be apologetic for what we ask, yeah. excuse me, ask for. Whereas I've never had that conversation with somebody that is male that I've, I've called and said, can you work this gig? Um, it's, it's always been my female friends. And we have to, as women in this industry, or in any, any profession, we have to stop being apologetic for what we want. We work hard. We work as hard as the next person. Actually, Solomon Group is one of the places that um, was the first to really, I feel like, pay me what I was worth. And, <laughs> and told, like, I asked for a certain day rate, and then they, uh, who was I talking to? They were like, no, 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 we're going to go up from that. That's not, that's not your day rate. And I was right. like, oh, I mean, one okay. Of the, one, <laughs> of the, one of the first events I worked with uh, for Solomon Group was Essence Festival. And I know I got paid 10 times more the year before working for the other production company, but I felt I had to prove myself. So mm. I presented an offer to them because I hadn't worked with them before, and they didn't know my work ethic, they didn't know my experience with Essence Festival prior to that, and I completely dumbed down my salary rate, like to, you know, a day rate instead of a week's rate, mm -hmm. um, because I needed to, I felt I needed to prove myself to this organization, and fast forward, I'm there full time, and it's all worked out great, um, but, I think with Solomon Group especially, they're you know, one of the fastest growing production companies. And they're a, an interesting example of a culture in an organization that if you work hard, you're gonna, depending on the budget, you're going to get paid for, for what the work that you do. And, and off, more times than not, we accept the rate that people are, are offering us. Um, but there is still, you know, it is a culture that is, I don't think there's many women in the company, but we're fast growing, and I don't feel that there's, they're not gonna hire somebody because it's a woman versus a man. And mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a good example of any women going into that company can, can set their tone and set, set what they wanna do, and it's up to us to, to define that role for us. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, I think for me, because I have uh, kids, it kind of puts it into perspective for me because you know productions long hours and so early on I, I think probably for about four or five years I did what Christine was doing proving myself I didn't work pretty much for anything I worked these long hours for nothing to prove myself and you know then it got to a point where it's like well I need to ask for what I feel my time is worth if I'm spending you know, all these days away from my children, I have to pay for a sitter a lot of times, a lot of these different things. And so I just kind of asked for what I want and I didn't really think too much about, well, what would a man be getting paid in this mm -hmm. position? It was just kind of like, what could I live with? You know, yeah. so I, I did that and when you start thinking about tuition and extracurricular activities for kids, which a lot of women in production don't have children, 
Um, so when I think about all those things, it makes me a lot less sympathetic to someone's budget maybe. It's just kind of like, well, this is what I feel I'm worth. This is what I need to get paid. And if they can't do it, then I just have to be comfortable with moving on from that. Yeah, if you don't stand up for yourself and ask for what you want, you're never going to get it. Never. So that's one of the biggest things that I've learned, and I think that most women can take away from it, is just to stand up for what you think you deserve and what your worth is. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's been a tough thing for me recently. And it's, it, I mean, honestly, for me, uh, the fight isn't just about being a female versus male. Um, I think that this town, there are some pl great places like Solomon Group that pay audio engineers well. And then there are a lot of places that do not, and they make very little, and they're working really long hours. And you know, and I, I want the musicians to make more too, but some of the musicians forget that they're there maybe for an hour or two hours, or maybe even three, and the sound guy is there for eight, 10, 12, you know? And um, I feel like across the board, it needs to be better pay in the city for engineers. Um, and, and lighting people and production people in general, you know. But I do think that I thought what you said was interesting about a man never kind of being apologetic for his rate. And I do think that was a, a difficult thing for me for a long time, you know. And I think women are more sympathetic to people's budgets and thinking, oh, okay, well, I need to prove myself, so I'm going to do this and I'm going to, you know cut my rate here, or I'll give you a deal. And I think that oftentimes men um, will go, if there's a female in the crew, they'll go to them first as far as trying to get them to bring their rate down because they know that they're more likely to do it. So I think you guys are right. Like we, it has to, you have to be more stern, you know? Cool. Well, I got a 10 minute warning from Scott. So I thought maybe we would open it up to questions from you guys. Does anyone have any questions? Marcy Schrem uh, was executive director of French Quarter Festivals. Yeah. Before that, she was director of the New Orleans Opera. She had the, um, that particular festival grew to the second largest economic impact in New Orleans. She did retire from that position uh, mm -hmm. because of family considerations, but she really grew the festival. And could you say she's a female, Quint Davis? Mm -hmm. She's a wonderful lady, a good friend of mine. So yeah. just letting you know, she w has been very successful in this. Yeah. And their new festival director is actually a woman as well, Emily yeah, Madero. Yeah, that's right. So. Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Danny Melnick. I'm the uh, Newport Jazz Festival producer. And um, I started working for George Ween in 1990. And um, this building is the George and Joyce Ween building. And when George Ween started this festival in 1970 here in New Orleans, Joyce Ween, his wife, was an extremely important part of that reality and important part of his entire business. Everything that he did uh, all through his life, um, Newport Jazz, Newport Folk, uh, New Orleans, Nice, many other festivals, uh, Joyce was an incredible deep part of that. And when I first met her, I didn't know who, really who she was. I just knew that she was Joyce's wife. And I learned very quickly um, how important she was to the business. And when George started the festival here, he found Quint and Allison Minor. And Allison Minor was uh, an incredibly important part of the development of Jazz Fest. She passed away, uh, I think in the mid 80s. She was like 45, 46 years old. And she was an epic person here in the history of this festival. And I also wanted to say that George's artistic director all through the years here in New Orleans and many other cities was uh, Marie St. Louis, who was one of my great mentors, and now Darlene Chan is the senior booker. She is uh, 50 years now in LA producing festivals at the Hollywood Bowl and what have you. So all incredible women, amazing mentors to me. Um, I wouldn't be able to do anything that I do without any of them. And I just wanted to congratulate all of you for all the awesome work that you guys do. So, Kind of want to echo what you're saying. I think we're really, really lucky to live in New Orleans. Um, one of the questions when we were all emailing about this panel was, do you have um, female role models? I think that Voodoo has always been really female forward, Buku's always been really female forward, and Jazz Fest especially has an amazing team of women running their production. Um, I personally would not be where I'm at today if it weren't for people like uh, Libra Lucro and Becky Fredella, 
uh, Chrissy Gross, uh, Megan Grant, you know, all women that when I was 21, 22, right out of college, I just saw them and I was like, whoa, these are some badass women working production and I, how can I emulate them and how can I be that like hardworking and good at my job and nice to everybody around me? Um, so I think to echo your sentiment, we're really lucky. New Orleans has always had a really, really solid group of women running shit. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. And Chrissy Gross being particularly one of them when I had that first live sound gig at House of Blues definitely like took me under her wing and encouraged me and has hunt. We've gotten to work together a lot. Hi. Um, we briefly mentioned something about um, how the music industry in Europe is um, a little bit more gender balanced. Um, I'm wondering if you can kind of comment a little bit, those of you who have kind of touched the music industry in, um, in Europe, just like what are some of the conditions, what are some of the things that they're doing right that we can learn from locally or domestically? Um, yeah, so I think, you know, what I meant was that um, I, they might not be more gender balanced than the U.S. music industry, I'm not sure, but I do think that they're more aware of the imbalance um, like they're actually putting out studies on what that imbalance looks like, the numbers. I haven't really seen that in our industry with music in particular. Um, I haven't worked in the UK music industry. Um, I, Alex, I'm not sure. I, I've definitely, I've been to Europe and Japan and Malaysia and Pakistan and I've gotten to go to some really interesting places and as far as like production and women in production, um, I can tell you that in Japan, I worked four of those 14 were in Japan. I had two shows, and both my monitor engineer and my front of house engineer um, on both shows were female. And when I was, and I think that it's interesting that I actually want to work on my reaction when I get to work with another female because I just get way too excited. And, you know, I should be treating, I feel like I should be treating them just like they're just any other engineer, but I can't. I get too excited. And um, they didn't blink an eye. They just, they weren't surprised that I was female at all. They were surprised that, uh, at my surprise. So it's very normal there. And it was actually, I did what I hate people to do to me. You know, I went to the, there was a guy on stage and there was a girl on stage and I went to the guy and I introduced myself thinking he was the monitor engineer and he goes, oh no, 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 this is, this is, and you could tell he had a lot of respect for her and um, it did seem to be different there and I've talked to other artists that have toured in Japan a lot and that was something that I've seen there. In Europe, um, I actually, it's pretty much the same in audio at least, but there's a lot of female lighting people um, and there was a lot more females in production and in charge of things, I think, than I, I see here. Um, n not in New Orleans, but in the States. Because uh, I do think in New Orleans, we, I agree, we're very lucky that there are a lot of women here, and I think it has definitely encouraged my career. Um, well, I, I don't know. I, I know I kind of had your reaction just the other day at, uh, well, last week at Jazz Fest, um, there was an African-American girl on camera, and I got, like, so excited. I've never met her. I don't know who she is, but I, I have to find out. But I got so excited, and I was like, oh, my God, I need to meet her. I need to know who she is because I thought it was amazing because um, for African-Americans across the board, there are not very many women, and I think it's just an issue of exposure. Mm -hmm. um, I think I was lucky enough, I had a friend, Tanisha Biagas, who worked for a Voodoo Fest, who kind of pulled me in, mm -hmm. and I think it's just ex uh, exposure for mm -hmm. minorities. Oh, uh, yeah. And my, like my daughter, I she's, I bring her with me to work, and she's like, oh, cool. Mommy, I love your job, you have the coolest job. So I think that's like a little seed, I don't know if she'll go yeah. into production, but it's just that exposure. I, I think I think you're right, and I think that um, there is more exposure for males in in audio or in pr production roles because um, because of they because of the physical aspect. Mm -hmm. I know that when I was teaching at Delgado, I was teaching a live sound class, and it was really interesting. The many different women that came up to me said, "You know, I never thought I'd be able to do this job, or I thought it'd be too." physically demanding or I didn't think that um, I'd be able to hang in there or I have kids or I, you know I didn't think I'd be able to find a job like oh I can't work late hours and I'm like well there's other work you know there's corporate right. work there's daytime things and um, but one thing that I, I think would encourage that is you know I would love to do like 
I think soundgirls.org is great. They do workshops and they do reaching out to um, like younger women. Like I think doing a program here to reach out to like high school and uh, middle school even to just show, expose the different roles in music. I think it's also really important to look at the city that we live in, which is New Orleans. And if you look at the uh, demographics of New Orleans, and then you look at how that demographic plays into people working in production, um, like what Sharita was saying, it would be really incredible if there were more opportunities for African American women to have those, those experiences and to be empowered to work in live sound or work in lighting or event production. Um, I think that is something that we could all work to improve diversity in all of the events that, we, uh, that we're doing. You know, it's New Orleans, it's an incredible place. We're lucky to live in a city that's so accepting of everybody. Um, and it'd be really cool if we could maybe come up with something to kind of empower young women. I'm on board. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think I think we're out of time and that seems like a good ending point. So thank you guys so much. And it's